in the book of John, uh, a lot of times I know a lot of pastors, and I've even done this, I've rethought it since this, but that um, after someone just comes to know Jesus Christ as Savior, they're a child of God, they're usually interested in reading the Bible, and a lot of people say, well, read, read the book of Psalms, which is good, and nothing wrong with that. But a lot of people say, well, you need to read the book of John because it really covers our faith. As we mentioned last week, the book of Luke is a very, you know, Luke was a physician and he wrote a very physician-like book and it talks about our doctrinal position. It talks about having a doctrinal statement, what makes you unique in the world of religion. And most of us, most churches, most uh, denominationals, um, sections and such have some sort of uh, doctrinal statement, the things that make them unique. And, you know, in the world of, of uh, theology, we as uh, Baptist, and then secondarily our fellowship of churches refer to themselves quite often as missionary Baptists, um, have some unique beliefs. Um, John expounds on a couple of those doctrines and I have found that gets a little deep. So uh, while it is always a good book to read, I have found that uh, I've usually, if I send a new convert off to read the book of John, they're going to have a lot of questions. John's book has some interesting information for us to have, uh, no doubt. So we are looking at using the old Route 66 as our um, illustration and talking a little bit about that out of the, the fun things that we do, but um, that Matthew chapter 3, talking about making his path straight. So the path that the Lord um, walked in this earth, the beginning of that began with uh, under the ministry of John uh, the Baptist, as he's referred to, John the Dunker. That's what um, uh, Baptist means. It's, he wasn't John denominationally Baptist. He was John who immersed people. That's what the underlying word for uh, the Greek word is baptizo. We just bring it over into English. But uh, people who dyed garments, baptized them. They dunked them. They dipped them. Put them under. They didn't sprinkle them. That's not a really good way to dye something. Good way to ruin a shirt. Uh, and other things by sprinkling some things. My wife bought some brand new towels not long ago. And then I cleaned the bathtub with Clorox, and uh, got evidently a little close, because I have a unique one. She now has designated my towel, because my towel has some sprinkle marks on it. And um, so I know about that effect. In looking at John, a book that's named for its writer, but if you're going down the um, old Route 66, particularly in Arizona and New Mexico, you may have seen some of these sites. There's a large petrified tree there in the beginning and some hillsides that look a little bit like we have out here in Oregon, too, because you've been out to see the painted hills here. They have some painted hills just about everywhere, don't they? So... That first is the Petrified National Park in Arizona. I remember being there as a kid. I have some um, petrified wood in my yard that I inherited from my mother. I believe it is from this park. Back when I was a kid, people didn't think anything about taking souvenirs home, I think, from national parks. I don't know for sure, but anyway, I have some petrified wood at my house. And then the pictures we saw were the Painted Desert in Arizona and New Mexico. And they're wonderful. And as you look at them in the different layers, different times, I've noticed here in ours, uh, you know, when we were there, the colors were very vibrant and um, uh, had been moist not too long before. And the colors just really popped out. Sometimes not so much. And that's the way with this as well. Driving down that great freeway and now even the the interstates around us. 
and I say this more openly, anywhere that you drive, that if you're a person of faith, you are mindful that these sights that you're seeing, while weathered and worn by elements and tourists and time, uh, we're in the beginning, a part of God's work in creation. And perhaps the one that's none more impressive uh, in, uh, you know, arguably in our United States is, of course, uh, the Grand Canyon. And if you've been near to that and have seen that, and the expansiveness of it is hard to put into a photograph, but, um, you know, that's, as I'm looking over the internet, that's the one I settled on because it fit my frame uh, better than some others, but, you know, creationists, people believe that, that the world was created by God, and those of science who want to tell us how billions and billions of years ago something eroded and became the Grand Canyon are at odds. I'm not saying that God created the Grand Canyon. I'm saying God created the earth, and many of the things that we see are the result of his creation. Sometimes cataclysms change the way our world looks. Rather than being billions of years old, what hap would happen if you had a great flood? In fact, what would happen if you had a great sea in the northwest of the United States that all of a sudden decided to flood and flood south and create a great deal of many things? And we have in Washington, the Palouse Valley, and here the Columbia Gorge. There's even a rock over by the zoo in Portland that by examination they say this rock should be in Montana. How did that rock get to Oregon? Well, a lot of water flowed at some time or another, and the changes in our world, uh, many of them are the result of a great flood. Uh, so there we go. So there are things that uh, we see and are the benefactor of, but originally there was no world in which we live today, and then there was one. It all began with the Lord. In John chapter 1, you all can read that, right? It's Greek to you and to me as well. We'll come back to that. There's a reason that we're going to talk about Greek a little bit today. Greek, the Koine Greek, or the ancient Greek, is what the New Testament is written in. It's not in English. We've translated it from that. It's not in Hebrew. It's from the language at the time of the revelation of the New Testament. Greek was kind of the English language of the time. You know, almost all over the world you can speak English. They tried to, to cater to you. Years ago, I was in Israel. Signs are in Hebrew and English, um, particularly around the tourist spots, because <laughs> they would like to have English money, you know, from you at a tourist spot. But anyway, what we're going to look at is John chapter 1, the first three verses to launch into our lesson today. Which says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Let us again go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity you've given us to come and to study your word. And as we survey this book today, that um, in looking through it and finding that which uh, should be spoken about today, we just ask, Lord, you open our hearts and understanding that we might understand not only um, so much content is here for our study, but very specifically you want us to know that you are the almighty God. Grant us now this way, we ask it all in your son's name, amen. All right, we're going to chart, John, a little bit, some facts and tidbits of information that go along with the book, things that we observe as we study through. If you have a study Bible, it probably has an introduction to the book of John. And uh, I look at, a, I have various uh, uh, commentaries and such that I look 
at for information and resources. I am not the authority on the book of John. I rely on, stand on the shoulders of men and women who have studied far more than I have, and I get to read their notes. And so uh, I quote quite a bit from others who have done this research. First of all, we need to know that this gospel is great. It's the fourth of the gospels. It is not a synoptic gospel. The other three are. They kind of cover the same period of time. They have references to each other. And John is not like that. He stands out separate from them. He's still considered the gospel because of the good news. If nothing more than John 3.16, this book is a gospel message for us to know. But he also penned 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and the book of Revelation. So uh, this is not his only uh, book that he has penned. We say authorship. The author is really God, isn't it? God put into the heart from, you know, his mind into the heart of men and from his heart into the mind of men. So that while they were allowed to write in their own style and use terms and such as they found necessary, they were guided to record truth and the essences of what God wanted to be revealed. So we find that sometimes a purpose in writing and overall, it seems to me that uh, what could be easily said, because of the importance of the way the book of John begins, that we could probably say safely, the point that is being made is that he wants to defend a particular belief. And in the writing of the gospel is at least in part a defense for the divinity of Christ meaning that we understand, we believe Jesus Christ is God, every bit as much as God, as Father, and as Holy Spirit. And, uh, of course, a lot of people have a hard time understanding how there can be uh, three and yet one, and yet here we are. We are body, mind, and soul, and yet what I see are people. But you have more to you than what you see on the outside. I am familiar with the illustration of what water can be. It can be a, a vapor. It can be a solid. It can be whatever it is, and it still is H2O in all of its forms. And so this is God in a, in a way for us to understand. We are formed and made in his image. When we someday will stand before God, we're not going to see some weird Martian monstrosity of some scientific feat. You're going to see somebody that looks like you because you're going to see in the personage of the Son uh, that portion of God, you're going to see Jesus Christ. And so it's, uh, it's hard for us to get this all in line, but a lot of people in not being able to do that have asserted that Jesus was lesser, a lesser kind of deity, more man than God, and he was created. In other words, that he didn't exist until... Uh, brought into the flesh in his what's called the incarnation. Uh, we look at that and we celebrate that quite often around Christmas time uh, for his birth, although we don't have a birth date. We don't know exactly when he was born and uh, that sort of thing, but we do know that he came into the world. So John begins his gospel with the, the divinity of Christ, asserting him to be God and proving him to be truly and properly so by the very works of creation. We can say the theme in presenting Jesus as the Son of God from eternity is what John is doing. So, Son of God. And uh, some say, well, that's, uh, you know, an heir. He's, uh, you know, um, then he's been born to somebody. He's been born, but we also know from Scripture that he is from eternity as well. In John chapter 1, verse 32 through 34, it says, And John, bear, and this is John the Baptist, And John the Baptist bear record, saying, I saw the Spirit sending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but that he sent me to baptize with water. The same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, and remaining on him, the same as that which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So in it. In, um, in bold there are the words of John as he's writing the book that he heard John the Baptist say, this is who I was told about, that as he performed uh, the baptism, 
Uh, we know baptism has nothing to do with the salvation of one's soul. It is an act of obedience. And Jesus Christ was obedient to the Father to submit himself, be baptized by John. This is to fulfill all uh, things in order as God had intended. But he uh, did not need to be saved because he came to be the Savior. And so uh, this is an act of obedience. And we, when we are baptized, also are obedient to follow in his likeness to show that in our case that we've buried the old person and we are raised uh, to walk in a new light, a new life, which is shown through that burial uh, which in the water represents. And uh, John says, I saw and bear record. I, I'm testifying that what I know is that this is the Son of God. This is a personage of God. I am looking at him, and this is God. Some uh, Also, for some other information, John Gill in his commentary is uh, more reserved by some, a historian by the name of Eusebius, that the other three evangelists only record what is done by Christ in the year following uh, when John the Baptist was cast into prison. Um, using Matthew 4.12 as a reference, but John, uh, perhaps at the uh, begging or entreaty of his friends, put these things to his gospel, which were done and said by Christ before John was cast into prison. This we also know from Albert Barnes' uh, commentary. John was the youngest of the apostles when called by Jesus. And John lived to the greatest age in his 90s, probably around 96, um, thereabouts. Uh, not quite 100, but he got up into the 90s. And uh, he is the only one who is supposed to have died a peaceful death. He was called to be a follower of Jesus while engaged with his father and his older brother, James mending their nets at the Lake Tiberias. John does not refer to himself in the first person. But he says uh, at least five times, that disciple whom Jesus loved. And other references. And uh, he's represented in uh, chapter 13, verse 23, as the one leaning on the bosom of the Father at the Lord's Supper. And an evidence of a, we'd say, unusual or a, a relationship that stands out. He points out that it seems that he and Peter, perhaps James, um, are, uh, they stand out among the disciples when things are happening. It was a great foot race in the book of John, right? So uh, where I get some material, there's a website called church org and they have made a video series about some of these happenings and uh, it's rather humorous because they have John and Peter talking about the foot race they had to get to the the tomb and John beating but Peter got in the door first so uh, why would that be in the word of God that of a foot race well I don't know but John thought it was important that he beat Peter because he had the book so he wrote the book so he could say I beat him to the tomb then he went in first. So uh, a little bit of their humanity does come across in the words that we read. Um, Jesus, as the oldest son, assumes responsibility. And to John, perhaps a cousin, we'll mention that in a few moments, was committed the care of Mary. She is said to have lived for about 15 years more after the ascension of Christ. So um, she was young of age when Jesus was born. Uh, probably, you know, add 20 years, so he's in his 30s, so she would be in her 50s, so sometime probably within the, her 50s um, she uh, passed. Would not, would not be too unusual for that time period. And uh, some believe I have yet to find the full, um, I guess, proof for me that Salome, which is, uh, so it was, Zebedee and Salome that John and James were the children of, that it said because she is a follower and follows uh, the entourage uh, through Jesus' ministry, um, that there is some reference that she might be Mary's sister. 
And if that's so, then these uh, John and James would be cousins uh, of Jesus by birth to Mary, not, of course, by a divine connection. An ecclesiastical history tradition informs us that he spent the majority of his life in Asia Minor, that he resided chiefly at Ephesus, the chief city of that country. So when we read of Ephesus, we have a book called the Ephesians, and uh, John evidently spent much time in that area. Maybe one reason why it is such a mature church. Of all the churches in the New Testament, the church that seems to glorify God, that is, the church that is right, that is in all aspects, serving God, loves God, teaches what's right is Ephesus. And uh, John spent a great deal of time there. In the latter part of his life, he was banished to Patmos, a small, desolate island in the Aegean Sea, about 20 miles in circumference. circumference. On that island, he penned the book of Revelation. After his return from Patmos, he lived peaceably at Ephesus and until his death, which is supposed to have occurred not long afterward. He was buried at, at, at uh, Ephesus and has been commonly thought that he was the only one of the apostles who did not suffer martyrdom. And we don't know exactly, and tradition holds this, that um, he was sentenced to death and oil was prepared for him to be boiled in, which was a, um, is a form of torturous death that had been prepared and that he was dipped into it and without effect uh, lived on the rest of his life. So um, I wasn't there. I didn't observe it. It is a tradition. There is no biblical uh, verse to tell us that that's exactly what happened. But uh, there are a lot of extra biblical resources that do mention him and this miraculous happening in his life. Let us look at, uh, at Scripture, and I, I felt that I should put this up just for us to get a, an indication of why it's important for this first portion of Scripture for John. So the New World Translation, or what's called Je the Jehovah's Witness Bible, um, says this about John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the word was a God. And do you see the difference between what we just read a little bit earlier? The Jehovah's Witnesses are not the only ones that believe this. Most of the cults, and there are a great deal of cults in the world today, and this is not a new error. One of the first two errors that uh, attacked the New Testament church was Gnosticism, or the idea that I can know so much that I can be holy. And the other one was, is that they started to wonder, was this Jesus really God? Or was he just a good guy? And that, those two heresies survive even to this day. And so, what is this group that uh, purports to have? Well, this is what Jehovah's Witnesses believe about that. Jesus Christ is not like Jehovah, the only true God. He is rather a lesser created divine being. So little g, God. What does the scripture have to say about that? And I say that simple, I, I wanted to show you how the process to find an answer goes. So you don't need a lot of resources. Uh, it's helpful if you have a book called Strong's Concordance, or another good one is Young's Concordance. I prefer um, Young's for the way he writes out, the, but Strong's, uh, makes it easy because he gives every single word in the New Testament a number. And therefore, you look up the number in Strong's Concordance, and you can find out what that word means. And if you can see that, uh, that's John 1.1 1, 1 in what we call uh, with Strong's numbers. So you see every number. You see N, G1722. I highlighted Oh, there it says the G3588. So in Strong's Concordance, you would look up number 35, uh, G3588. 
Anybody can do this. I can do this. And I'm doing it today to show you how simple it is to find an answer to a mistranslation. I believe today that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe he is every bit of as much God as any other part of the Trinity. And that this heresy has gone far enough and is in our world, but it is an easy answer. You can prove what the original text says by going to a place like Strong's. I have, uh, hopefully that shows up uh, a little bit. I used a different color. I thought that was a little darker, but anyway, I just put Strong's. I didn't change it at all. This is the way it appears in Strong's Concordance. There are several ways that this word is referred to, and uh, you see the, uh, each of them given. As is evident from the forms, and he gives on to the different forms, and he recalls from others who write in Greek. So Homer and the iconic writings, uh, he compares to make sure that uh, this is a correct understanding, corresponds to our definite article, which is from the German der, die, das, which is properly a demonstrative pronoun, which we see in its full force in Homer, of which we find certain indubitable traces also in kinds of Greek prose, and hence also in the New Testament. And you go, well, that didn't help a whole lot, because that's kind of confusing. What he's saying is, is, is that that word, 3588, is a def definite art article in our English, meaning the, not an indefinite article like a. It means the. And there's another reason for that. Listen to someone who teaches Greek. So how many articles are there in the Greek alphabet? In English, there are two articles. The is the definite article, and A is the indefinite article. Greek has only one article. Since there are 24 forms for it, they couldn't afford a second one. In Greek, there is no indefinite article. A is a mistranslation. It always is translated the, definite. And so, what does that tell us? Our English translation that you have in your King James, New King James Version, uh, all that I know of the major English translations that we have, have properly translated that verse. Now let's break down that verse just a little bit so that can, we can see what John was trying to get across. So in the beginning, in the beginning when? When's the beginning? Well, he makes a reference to the beginning, and the beginning is the beginning. Genesis 1.1, 1, 1. in the beginning, what was in the beginning? God. In the beginning, God. So before there was a record of time, there was God. And he chooses through the next few verses of Genesis chapter 1 to tell you what happens in a literal 24-hour day, seven-day week of his creation effort. Did he need seven days? No. Why did he choose seven? It's because it's up to him. Seven quite often is a, uh, a number of perfection. And so after seven days, uh, including one day of that, which is a rest day, uh, a Sabbath, that God made everything. Well, he didn't make lights or fans or carpet. We would not have any of these things in this room today had God not created. Man takes elements, but he cannot make elements. Well, he can do a lot of cool things. He can do a lot of cool things. He, you know, of all the creative things we have made is plastic. Isn't it wonderful? It's also all over the beaches, and it's out in the ocean, and it's everywhere else. And some of us believe you can't even drink water unless it's in plastic, which is the same water here as what you're drinking out of the spigot. But nevertheless, uh, it just seems like we should. That plastic didn't come from nothing. The substances that make that plastic, God created. Out of nothing... The only way to get something is to be God. It just doesn't come from nothing. 
And so, when there was a time that there was nothing of the way we see it, there was something called the Word. The Word is the Greek word logos, which means communication, expression, knowledge, revelation. Everything that there is to know is in the word logos. So, in the beginning was everything to know. And the word, the logos, was with, which is with is the word pros, of the side, toward, companion, of God, which is theos in Greek. We get our English word theology from the study of theos, God, divinity. So, alongside and with all knowledge is God. And the logos, the word is was, the little word, in. In of or of essence, God. So, that which is all knowing is God. The same, which is the word hutus, of distinct composition, was with God. And that same entity were all things made by him. Creator, word, and God is one entity. All the things to know in all the universe, that's God. And God was compacted in himself, and along with himself created this universe. And yet, we are told more. Even in this wonderful book, I read just down to, to verse 3. But in verse 14 it says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. At some point, and we know this historically, uh, we have even enough secular historians that tell us that there was a place and a time when Jesus Christ walked this earth as a historical individual. And when he did, he was the Word made flesh. God in the flesh. And of course, what people have trouble with is now, and saying, how can this be? Because they read verse 18, which says, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Even in our English, I think it's plain, but nevertheless, again, let us look a little bit at the language laying under this. And it is a Greek word, exegiomai, which means to consider out aloud, expose, rehearse, unfold, declare, tell. There's an English word uh, that we use in Bible study. And anybody that's written a report... They, they do an exegesis, exegical. What is that? It means that we bring out the meaning from whatever we're writing about. When I was uh, working on uh, uh, higher education, which is hard to believe that higher education exists when uh, you're in McFarland, you know, but there was a time when uh, these things uh, did approach, and I was working on a master's degree. I wanted to be and was going into a field of work and have been in it kind of since. So I, um, before I moved, I come here by way of Utah, and before that, Washington State. And in Washington State, I was a mental health um, counselor, therapist. 
And so uh, mostly working on myself, but I did help some other people too occasionally. The uh, child and family therapy, I did a lot of that. A lot of uh, teenagers I have seen in my days. But I had to do uh, a paper when it came down to the final thing. And it's essentially an exegesis of a subject. Exposing all that you can about a subject. And this is what the Son does for God. Jesus is the outer exposure or declaration, revelation of the unseen theos. Have you seen God fully? Have you seen God? I have not. I haven't even seen Jesus. But I have experienced him through the Holy Spirit. I know this is why sometimes I feel like I do. I know that that was present when I accepted Jesus Christ. And he is today the empowerment of this New Testament church. Just as surely as Jesus Christ walked the earth, he is present today in this service. We talk about this being holy ground. This little building in Madras, Oregon is holy ground today because you are having a meeting with God himself today. He is here and is in your presence. If you're a child of God, if you know him as Savior, he is living within you. He has indwelt you. He lives in your soul. And that's why we can be rescued in the, uh, in the end to go to a place we call heaven. And this is a wonderful thing. How you know that is because Jesus revealed him. You haven't fully seen God. But you have seen the declaration of him and the revelation of him through Jesus Christ. Now then, this means that there is more to the story. But I have to, I'm going to stop right here before I say anything else to let you know that if you have other questions about this and would like to talk to me, of course, feel free. But the reason that these verses exist is for me to be able to say with a surety today that Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Father are one. They are co-equal God in one person. Just like you are a human, and yet you are body, mind, and soul. I see what you are, and know the outside appearances of my wife, which I find attractive. But you know, I don't know all that goes on in her mind. Sometimes she finds it rather mystifying what's going on in my mind. I'm surprised she didn't say amen out loud on that one, but... Uh, we uh, alluded to this, that this might be a genetic thing, that guys and women, sometimes we think, look at the same thing, and we just look at things differently. I went to Costco yesterday and to a motorcycle store. What was more thrilling to me is I bought a new pair of gloves, and I was showing her she's more interested in the watermelon. Not sure... But, you know, these things are us. And what we have for us is to understand that we all are like this. You can't know me completely. You haven't seen all there is of me. You get to judge me, and we all judge. You know, give it up. Quit talking that you don't ever judge about nothing. You do. The scriptures don't say don't judge. They say judge correctly. When you have to make a decision, a judgment about something, understand somebody can just as well come back to you and ask you about something they need to ask about. We should be correct. We should be very cautious about this. I'm not advocating it, but I'm just saying that sometimes we're wrong about initial things we see. I've been wrong about a great many people by what I saw without getting to know them. And that's the way we all are. We're much more complicated than we appear to be. And sometimes, maybe we're not. Maybe we're as simple as what you see. 
But God is no less that. You want to judge God solely on Jesus Christ? Amen, you can. But no, you have yet to fully understand him if only you are a believer in just the Son. The Father tells us a great deal. And the power of the Holy Spirit is one to teach us and bring us great knowledge. So take them all in. One of these days, we will be in the presence of God, and we'll talk about these things, how great it was to, to believe now, and yet to see him then in the presence. It'll be an awesome time. Bruce Worson, who I quote off and on from this series, who has written some and has another series that goes along with this, and uh, I've read it, and he's, he's good about uh, some... Some points, and he makes this point. John's book is unlike the Synoptic Gospels. He includes no genealogy, a manger, uh, parables, transfiguration, ascension, or great commission. This wasn't his purpose in writing. So what was his purpose in writing? That which we just read. And uh, a further explanation is in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. It says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. I don't want to make it tedious today to talk about how these things in Greek help us to understand it, but the weos ho huion is... A little phrase that says Messiah is Christ. Messiah is Jesus, and Jesus is Son. This little phrase lets us know that Messiah is the Son of God. He was not created. He didn't just become the Son of God at his birth to, in the physical sense, to Mary. The Son has always been the Son. God didn't make a Son. God is and always has been the Son. That's the doctrine. This is the key element. This is what separates mainline Traditional evangelical Christianity from the cults. That God has always existed, and if he has always existed, then so has the Son. Always existed. He didn't get created. He didn't get in, come into life just at his birth, but has always been in existence. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And what did God say in Genesis chapter 1? Let who make things? Us. Let us make man in our own image. Hebrew has singular, dual, and plural. Singular is one, dual is two, plural is three or more. And the terminology there is in plural, three or more among themselves say, let us make man in our image. It allows for God to be a singular entity and have within him three capacities to be the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. few more things about John as we'll hurry through. I don't keep you any more uh, longer this morning than we can. Actually, afternoon now. Sorry about that, but got to tell this whole thing. Only John tells the story of Jesus' first miracle, turning water into wine at the wedding in Cana. And it seems that this is when the disciples really put their faith in him. Now, I'm not going to read this whole text. But notice down at verse 11, 
This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Maybe a little shallow before that, but after they see water turned into wine, they go, this guy is the real thing. Of course, they have another experience out on the lake too, right? That uh, we've talked about that uh, gets them to think, uh, wow, this guy, this guy can even control the elements. He's the real thing. And he is. Only John records Nick uh, visit with a member of the Jewish ruling council named Demas. We find that in John chapter 3 where he talks to him and... You know, he says, uh, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. His name came to Jesus, but Pilate said to him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Very verily I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You're so close, Nicodemus. you got to understand this a little bit more. And that's why in the book of John, over 98 times, the word belief, believe. And so it is so appropriate that we find in John chapter 3, these verses 16 through 21, of course, are the full context. Let's just read those two that are so important for us, and that's John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent his Son into the world to... Uh, sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Believeth, an act of faith. Not just saying there is a God somewhere in the universe, but understanding that this is God and I need him in my life. John reacquaints us with the I am of Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14. And in chapter 8 of John, he goes through verses 56 through 59. They understood what he was talking about. He said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. What? Your day? You're just a young guy. And you say you were around him? They, was, they went to stone him. They knew exactly what he was saying. I am, I am. And I am simply means existence. I've always existed. God is ever existent. He's an entity that has no beginning and no end. And I am is what the best that we can get it into English, it seems like. But he goes, uh, tells us uh, in John that he's, I am the bread of life in John 6. I am the light of the world in John 8. I am the good shepherd in John 10. And I am the resurrection and the life in John 11. I am the way and the truth and the life in John 14. I am. We're told that his disciple... Uh, John was not perfect. John's not perfect. None of them are. None of us are. He tried to interfere or prevent someone ministering in Jesus' name, and he got rebuked in Luke chapter 9. He was vengeful and wanted Jesus to send down fire on an unwelcoming visit uh, village, and also in Luke chapter 9. He was forceful with, with his forceful mom, Speaking up, he asked Jesus for a position of power in his kingdom, and he had to be rebuked, Matthew 20. And he's noticed as one of the hot-tempered brothers nicknamed the Sons of Thunder by Jesus, which I think would make just a lovely motorcycle gang. So all those thunders, Sons of Thunder will join after church today. And then finally, John chapter 21, Peter, we just have to read this. I love Peter. He had, he's skilled as much as anybody I know in thinking something and not understanding it at all. Verse 20, then Peter turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is... He that betrayeth thee. Peter seeing him saith to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went his saying abroad the brethren that that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him he shall not die, but 
If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? This is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if we should be written, everyone, I suppose, that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. It strikes me just humorously because Peter's going, what's John doing? And Jesus says to him, Peter, what's, is that any of your business? Why are you concerned about John? Why don't you be concerned about Peter? Follow me. And this summarizes how the book ends for us to understand today. Who but you stands in the way of service to God? I've been hurt. I've been this. I've been that. Churches... A lot of people believe in God, but they don't want to have anything to do with organized religion. I'm sorry, people hurt you. It's full of hypocrites. I know, so is Walmart. But you go to Walmart. Hypocrite. I am. Got it. You know that about me? Thankful, we got that out of the way. If I offend you one of these days, I'm sorry. But don't go to the Lord and say... Pastor McFarland ruined my life. I'll never go in church again because of him. Now, if you have somebody that you said that about, something you believe that about, you're going to stand before God one of these days and he's going, what was that to you? You let somebody or something stand before you in serving God the best that you can? Even knowing John was imperfect, what does he tell him? He tells all the disciples. In verse 21 of chapter 20, Jesus said to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. We have, we the imperfect, have a job to do.